from a uh, subject that the Lord impressed on my heart this week as we dealt through the many waves of trouble and difficulty that so many people are going through. And uh, the Lord put this word in my heart. And the title of the message is Stuck Between a Rock and a Hard Place. I'm just stuck between a rock uh, and a hard place. Uh, that's an old saying. You know, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Kind of an old country adage, you know. Sort of to reveal when you're in a situation where either way you move, it's going to be hard. I go over here, there's a rock. I go over here, there's a hard place. It's sort of an old country way of saying that you're in a situation where there's no easy way out. I don't know. How should we start the conversation this morning, huh? Let's keep it light. Let's not go too heavy, too controversial. Let's, let's keep it light. Uh, let's talk about the vaccine. <laughs> there are few more polarizing topics that I can remember in my lifetime. I thought the previous election polarized us. I had no idea what polarization was. Uh, the vaccine. There's no shortage of passion on either side of the issue. The people who are for it are really for it. <laughs> the people who are against it are really against it. And these days, if you pick a position, you can find some data on the Internet to back it up. And so everybody's armed with facts from their phone and and... Usually facts from your phone just tend to dig you deeper in whatever trench you were standing in in the first place. And um, starting to hit home, though. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe it's the church's place to tell parishioners what you should put into your body concerning medicine or vaccines or whatever. You have a brain and you have the Holy Spirit. So my position is pray, research, and then make a, a decision that lines up with your convictions. But with that said, uh, when, Katie, when Katie moved to Texas to marry me, She left a successful salon behind in Cincinnati. And so when she started in San Antonio, uh, she immediately set up a salon. And, uh, and it was slow going at first. And uh, we were both invested into it. And I just remember the early days, every client that would come in to get their hair done, it was like, they were like precious to us, you know, precious. And as a result, we, we built some really deep friendships um, with the people that were the clients early on, you know. And um, after Levi was born, many of you know his story. He had some severe challenges he had to overcome, and she had to, she had to shut down her business to care for him. But maintained a close relationship with many of the clients, and, and one of them has become a really, really close friend. She's brilliant brilliant young lady. And uh, she works uh, as a nurse in a high-end medical group here in San Antonio. And she happens to be uh, one of those people that is really against 
the vaccine for personal reasons. It's not political reasons. She just has personal reasons. She doesn't want to take it. And she was called in last week by her boss. And her boss said, we're going to need you to take the vaccine or we're going to have to let you go. And, you know, we've shared that story with a lot of people, you know, in our circle, just kind of surprised by it. And, uh, you know, a lot of you may be thinking, they can't do that. How sweet of you. <laughs> they did it. And I bring up the point, not to say that you should take it or that you shouldn't take it. I bring up the point to highlight the kind of situation you're put in where you either accept something that you personally disagree with or you lose your job. It's one of those situations where you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Afghanistan's been in the news this week to continue the, the lightness of the conversation. Now, whether you are a passionate liberal or a staunch conservative, everybody across political lines agrees we can't stay there, you know? Uh, it's been 20 years, trillion dollars, and countless American lives. The nation-building project has not worked. And if you want proof for it, the Taliban was in control when we got there, and they're in control today. And so everybody, I mean, agrees, we got to leave. We can't stay. But then we found out this week that while we can't stay, leaving ain't easy either. And this morning, there's still thousands of Americans that are stuck between a rock and a hard place. And then, you know, you realize, you look across the landscape at what's going on in the family of mankind globally. And all of a sudden, you, you come to the realization that what's playing out on our television screens and newspapers and social media feeds is indicative of what many of us are going through on the inside in our personal lives, in our personal circumstances. Many of us have come to a place in our lives where the unique arrangement of the circumstances has left us feeling stuck yeah. between a rock and a hard place. The text we've been using all day here at Christian World is extracted from the brilliant book of Genesis. Now you want to be careful when you're reading the book of Genesis because it's easy to miss a whole lot. Genesis is unique in that God in his majesty, while the narrative of the story was playing out, God sowed deep theological, biblical truths in the book of Genesis by using objects to teach lessons. In fact, one of God's favorite teaching methods is object lessons. Jesus preached more in parables than he did referencing the Old Testament and going line by line. It was his favorite style is showing you a picture of one thing, natural, to help you understand something deeper, spiritual. And the book of Genesis is absolutely filled with this. For example, um, one of the symbols in Genesis that, that comes up pretty early is the symbol of evil, which is taken on by a serpent who tempts Adam and Eve. He tempts uh, our great-grandparents to the 50th power. He tempts them into sin. And it's, it's, it's uh, put up as a symbol of evil, the serpent. 
And then you have two animals. We'll later find out that there are two lambs. <clears throat> that once Adam and Eve fall into sin, God comes and kills two lambs and wraps them in the skins of the lambs. And we, we would find out that that's a symbol of blood atonement. And obviously the, the symbol builds in Exodus and in Leviticus through the sacrifice system. And it, it builds all the way up to the cross. But, but the whole thing is there. It's just in the symbol in uh, Genesis chapter 3. And then the prophecy, the first messianic prophecy, that the seed of the woman would rise up and crush the head of the serpent and that the serpent would also crush his heel. It was, it was the symbol and the sign, the seed of the woman. It was an announcement that a redeemer is coming and he's going to be born. He's going to be the seed of a woman. And his, his scope, his aim, his ultimate goal is to crush the power that caused us to fall. And so as, as you go into Genesis as a student and you're reading the narrative, make sure you pay careful attention to the symbols or else you've missed larger uh, portions of truth. And not only do we learn from the symbols in Genesis, we also learn by looking at the characters, the type of people that God chose to get involved with. <clears throat> and personally, I grew up pretty, uh, pretty conservative in, in the form of morals and uh, personal behavior and, and lining yourself up and, it, and being right in step with the scripture. Now, I, I, I failed it many times, but it was always ever before me. And so with that raising of, of what it looks like to, to be a morally sound and godly person, with that paradigm, it shocks me that God would get involved with somebody like Jacob. If you've ever wondered if you were qualified to walk with God or not because you got a shady past, Jacob's life is proof that God will get involved with shady, trifling, evil people. It's just shocking, you know. Jacob was a professional con artist. I didn't say he was a con man. I said he was a con artist. Anytime you, you know, take goat's hair off a goat and put it on your arms and your neck to go in and deceive your daddy while he's on his deathbed to try to steal a birthright away from your own blood brother, that's artistic. Have your mama in there cooking up something using the same spices your brother uses when he cooks, trying to, trying to deceive your blind, dying daddy so you can take the inheritance away from your brother. That's, that's, that's a special kind of evil. That's a, that's a special kind of wicked. And, you know, uh, Jacob was great at it. He, he learned from the best. His mama was a con artist. You know, most of the time, when people are wicked, they're not wicked without a cause. They're wicked because somebody put those tools in their bag. Be careful what tools you put in your children's bag. Be careful what you let them see you do. Because everything you do is a lesson, good or bad. <clears throat> Everything communicates good or bad. And, and, and most people aren't wicked just to be wicked. I have some exceptions, but most people are wicked because they're desperate. Wickedness is all they've been exposed to. And they think the only tools that can be used to reach for success are the negative tools of life. And so Jacob is using trickery and manipulation Lying, deceit, theft, just robbing people. He's using those as his tools. And it's one thing to do that in, in your teens, in your 20s. But when you're 
approaching 50 years old, still scheming. Approaching 50 years old, still trying to con people, still hurting people, still robbing people, still cheating people. The, the, the byproduct of it is the more people you hurt, the more people you have to run from. <laughs> I, uh, I know you can't get with me on this, but just like for the one and a half people that are here that can, yeah. You ever done somebody wrong, you know, years and years and years ago, and then like you see them in the grocery store? And Jacob has done so many people wrong, you don't have anywhere to go. And he's got... He's got everybody that he's wronged chasing him. And in our text, he's tired. He's tired of fighting. He's tired of running for his life. He's tired of dealing with his own issues. And really, if you really peer into it, he's tired of himself. Nobody tells you about this, but, but there's a few of us that know what it's like just to get sick and tired of your own self. Sick and tired of the way you talk. Sick and tired of the way you think. Sick and tired of your weaknesses. Sick and tired of continuing to succumb to the same things over and over and over again. And he's, and he's tired. And in verse 11 of the text, he's, he's been running all day. He's tired physically. He's been running all day. He's tired emotionally and spiritually because he's been running from people all of his life. And he comes to a place and... He can't run anymore because the sun sets. Now, normally, he would have kept just running. The thing about Jacob, you read his stories. The man had phenomenal stamina and physical endurance, you know. And uh, if you're going to be wicked, it helps to be strong and fast, you know. <laughs> And uh, so he normally he would have kept running, but he comes to a place where the ground is rocky and the landscape is uneven. It's very dangerous. You could fall and turn an ankle. You could, you could have a misstep, break a leg. Very dangerous to keep going because it got so dark. And in a situation where he would have normally kept going, when he loses his sense of direction, and he can't see because the sun has set. For the first time in a long time, the man has to stop. Sometimes God will allow you to go into dark seasons. So you'll stop. Sometimes he'll allow you to lose your sense of direction in a dangerous, unstable place. So that for the first time in a long time, your crazy self will stop. And so God wants to do something in Jacob's life, but he's not going to do it while Jacob is running with his own agenda. God wants to do something in your life. He wants to deal with the dysfunction that's been plaguing you, but he won't do it as long as you're running with your own agenda. So if you're in a dark place and you've lost direction and you're frustrated because your instinct is, I got to keep going, I got to keep running, God may be telling your crazy self to lay down for a minute and stop so I can deal with some stuff in your life that's preventing you from reaching the place he called you to go. God makes him stop. And when he stops, he happens to be in a hard place. Bishop told you about it. The place that he's in is so hard that the softest thing he can find for a pillow is a rock. And he 
shuffles the stones together for a bed and lays his head on the rock and he goes to sleep. Now, it's difficult to sleep when you're in a hard place. I had a tough week of praying and intercession. A lot of people on my prayer list, a lot of people right now going through a hard place. I've been praying for a sister that attends the church here. She's a young lady. Four months ago, her daddy died. And her daddy, he was, he was a mountain of a man, stable, strong. Four months ago, he died. It's been hard. It's a hard place. And then last week, her mama died four months later. Lost both parents in four months. It's a hard place. I've been praying for one of Katie's friends. Had a baby two years ago. And the baby had everything wrong with it that you could imagine. They all guaranteed to die. Katie went to the hospital, laid her hands on that child, and commanded life to come back in. And God worked a miracle, and that baby lived, but the baby has cerebral palsy. Two years old now. Now. <clears throat> Medical science, as they keep advancing have come up with this specific type of therapy for toddlers that have cerebral palsy. If you can start this therapy early enough, you can drastically improve the brain-body connection. And if you start when you're two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old, by the time you're in your 20s, it's a game changer for your mobility. And uh, this this... This specific apparatus is a, it's a highly technical walker that uh, helps the child, you know? It helps the child with the steps and moving the limbs and all that. But it's very expensive. And uh, they don't have the money to pay for it. And the insurance won't cover it. It's thousands of dollars. They need it. The baby needs it. In fact, the therapy should have started about three months ago. And they're desperate can't pay it. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And then there's you. I mean, you look great this morning. Really, you do. You're bright eyes. You got nice clothes on. You got your hair done. You look good. But I know scattered throughout the congregation are so many people that are just, you're in a spot either in your marriage. You know, you just marriage is in a hard place. We don't have to cherry pick any one particular issue. It could be anything. The reality is the mayor is just in a hard place. Or some of you, your finances, it's just, it's in a hard place. You don't feel like you can move, you feel stuck. Or maybe it's your relationship with your children. The children maybe have hit a certain stage and it's just interacting and relating with them it's so difficult now. It's, it's not like it used to be. And you're kind of worried about what they're turning into and who they're becoming. And, and then you're worried about you. What are, kind of monster are you becoming that you produce this kind of monster? And, and you just kind of stuck. <laughs> Between a rock and a hard place. <clears throat> Some of you dealing with Elderly parents that need care. And you need care yourself, all the issues you got right now. You're dealing with other people's burdens and you need some help with your burdens. Or, or, or you're dealing with the kind of complexities maybe, maybe on the inside that you can't even tell anybody about. You ever had a problem so personal? You, you pick up the phone and call to ask for prayer and then you think about what you're going to have to say and then you just hang up the phone because you don't want to say that. Hard place. And to 
to that end, it's what makes the text amazing to me because it is while Jacob is in a hard place trying to sleep that God appears to him. What I love about God is his presence is not limited to church. <laughs> I know that churches have been trying to teach that it is, but it's not. God, you don't have to be in church to get into the presence of God. What I love about God, if God wants to, he'll show up in a hard, hard place. And then the next thing in the text that just blows my mind is that God showed up, not just that he showed up in a hard place. He showed up for a guy like Jacob. Jacob ain't been fasting and praying and consecrating and living clean and holy. Jacob's been conning people, stealing, lying, and running for his life. And it's just strange. That the God of holiness and righteousness, the God who tells his people, be ye holy for I am holy. That God come out from among the world and be separate. That, that God shows up for a guy. Jacob. And then he speaks to him. Gives him his word. That's, that's, that's amazing. And then he blesses him. He blesses him. He shows up and he says, hey, um, you don't know me, but I am almighty God. I'm the God of your grandpa, Abraham. And I'm the God of your father, Isaac. He doesn't say he's Jacob's God yet. That hadn't been established. But because your grandpa walked with me, and because your daddy walked with me, I noticed you was in a hard place. So I came down here to see about you. And I... I know you've never prayed to me, but your grandpa used to pray to me about you. I know you've never offered a sacrifice to me, but your daddy used to offer me sacrifices and pray about you. So I came down here not because of you. I came down here because somebody before you prayed to me about you. And even though they're dead, their prayers still live on. So I, I couldn't let you stay in this hard place too long without coming down and introducing myself. Oh, almighty God. And it just meant so much to me in the text because a lot of us know that we wouldn't be here today unless somebody else prayed for us. That... That it hadn't been our prayers necessarily that's brought the blessing of God in our life. It hadn't been our faithfulness necessarily that's brought the, the power of God in our life. It's been the prayers of other people that put our, our name in their mouth when they talk to God. And, and he said, the land you're laying on, I'm going to give it to you. Hey, vagabond, running to and fro, place to place, with no place of your own, stealing, cheating, lying, trying to get ahead and get your hands around something that you've never been able to get your hands around. The thing you're running after, the thing you're conning for, the thing you're scheming for, I'm just going to give it to you. I'm going to give you the land that you're lying on. You can read that two ways in the text. I'm going to give you the land that you're lying on like laying down or considering Jacob's character. He could have been saying that land you've been running around telling lies on. I'm going to. Now, the, the question has to be asked. If we're going to follow a model, uh, we, we need to know how the model is set up. 
if we're going to follow a pattern of the scripture, we need to know uh, how the, the pattern is set up. What are the parameters here? Because um, most people had to pray to God to get God to give them a visitation, but Jacob did not pray. Most people had to, to live a separate lifestyle from the world. Jacob was all the way in the world. Most people had to offer some kind of sacrifice or something to get God to come down and give them his attention. Jacob didn't offer nothing. He wasn't offering. He was stealing and taking. And, you know. so, so what's the key here? What's the, what's the key to get this kind of visitation from God? Should we start conning our brothers and, and lying to our daddies on their deathbed and stealing as much as we can and lying and running from people? Is that, you know, what, what's the thing that, that drew this, this visitation? And, and I realized we have inverted the meaning of this text, I think, since, since the beginning of the church age. Everybody looks at Jacob in this text. This text is not about Jacob. Remember, I told you, Genesis is about symbols. It's about objects. And the real power of the truth is hidden in the object. The star of the text is not Jacob. The star of the text is the rock he laid on. Because, Bishop told you, that rock represents Christ. So, if, 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 Christ is the central piece of the text. Now I can see why a good and righteous and holy God could bless a man with poor character. Because what Jacob did is he put an unrighteous head over on a righteous rock. He put an unworthy head over on a worthy rock. He put a guilty head on an innocent rock. And this is the gospel, that we are not saved, communicated with, or blessed by God because of how righteous we are. We are saved, communicated with, and blessed by God because of how righteous Jesus is. And no matter what your issues are, if you stumble around and put your head in the right place, if you put your head on the rock that is Christ, not only will God God come into your situation. Not only will God speak his word to you, but God will bless you, not because of you. It's just because of where you put your head. If you're a guilty man, there's a rock for you. If you're a guilty woman, there's a rock for you. If your marriage is in trouble, there's a rock for you. If you've got a health condition, there is a rock for you. And it's never, it's never about your personal performance. Rather, it is about your position. Jacob didn't do anything right except position himself on the rock. <laughs> Most preachers won't tell you this. I'll tell you. I've never done anything right except position myself on the rock. All your famous heroes and people you look up to, if they're strong, you know, they never really did anything right except position themselves on the rock. It's why Paul said, where is boasting? That the rock took all the boasting away because I didn't do nothing to deserve the grace. I didn't do nothing to the deserve the mercy. In fact, I deserve judgment. I deserve the book to be thrown at me. But because of God's respect for the rock, when I put my head on the rock, heaven opened. Now, there's a series of events that happen when Jacob gets his head on the rock. First thing that happens, heaven opens. And, and the, ne the next thing to consider is not only did heaven open, uh, heaven opened in a hard place. You know, heaven opened in a hard place. Think, think with me. Isn't it amazing that God made sure that rock was in that hard place? God loves to introduce you to Christ. 
when you're in a hard place. Christ looks his best when your life looks its worst. And so, and so heaven opens up. And then the first thing Jacob looks up and sees, it's not an angel. It's not God. The first thing he looks up and sees is a ladder. Now, remember, you can't just read the narrative. You got to consider the symbols. What is a ladder? It's a mechanism whereby that you can reach what you were only ever previously able to see. You ever seen something, but you can't reach it? So, so the first thing Jacob sees is a ladder from the earth all the way up to heaven. And God sent me here to tell all of the people stuck between a rock and a hard place. If you get your head on the rock, he's going to send a ladder down for you. If you get your head on the rock, he's going to send the ladder down for you. If you get your head on the rock, he's going to send a ladder down for you. In fact, that's how you get out of being stuck between a rock and a hard place. If you are stuck between a rock and a hard place and you can't go left because there's a rock, and you can't go right because there's a hard place. And you can't go down because there's the ground. The only other option is you got to go up. And to go up, you need a ladder. God is dropping ladders in this service. A higher perspective, seeing it from a different level, a higher level of solutions, a higher level of crisis management, a higher level of strategic thinking, a higher level of looking at your life, a higher, just pulling you up to a level you could not have reached any other way. Some of you in a situation, the only way you're going to get out is a divine divine ladder. And God said, you mess around, get your head on that rock. The rock's so strong. The rock's so good. The rock is so righteous. The rock is so holy. You put your head on the rock, I'll drop a ladder. You put your head on the rock, I'll drop a ladder to your finances. You put your head on your rock, I'll, put, I'll drop a ladder to your health. You put your head on the rock, I'll drop a ladder for your business. He, he's dropping ladders be, be, because, because not, not, you know, to get Jacob out because Jacob's so good, you know. He's dropping ladders because of where Jacob's got his head. You know, you know, I can't let somebody with their head on my rock stay stuck like that. Here's a ladder. So first thing he sees is a ladder. The next thing he sees is angels. Now, what are angels primarily in the Old Testament, primarily they're messengers, okay? So the first thing God sends down is a word. Because your deliverance will always begin with a word. God started the earth with a word. Created all the things you see in the earth with a word created mankind with a word and the breath of his mouth and and, and if god is going to if god's going to save you it's going to start with a word you have to you have to hear because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of the lord if god's going to heal you it's got to start with a word if god's going to deliver you it's got to start with a word if god's going to bring you out of being stuck between a rock and a hard place it's got to start with a word. So God sends a messenger down the ladder with a word. But so that Jacob or you wouldn't think that this was a one-time occurrence, not only did Jacob see angels coming down, but he also saw them going back up. Or to be biblical with it, ascending, descending, up, down. Letting Jacob and you know 
I don't want to just have this one-off experience with you. I want to drop you a ladder so that we can have continual interaction between heaven and earth. In other words, I want to set up a reciprocal relationship with you where whenever you get in a tough spot, I can open heaven and send you a word down the ladder. But if I send you something down that helps you, you can send back up a praise. <laughs> if I send you something down that blesses you, you, you could send back up some worship. If I send you something down that heals and restores you, you can send back up some adoration. If I send you something down that delivers you, you can send back up a dance. If I send you some money down, you can send back up some tithe. When I send you something down, I'll leave the ladder in place so long as every time I send something down, you turn around and send something back wakes up. God was here. I didn't even know. God, don't let that be our testimony. Ooh. Don't let us be such a dull people that we miss our season of visitation. That God was here and I didn't know. So he quickly gets up. He's got to mark it somehow. He's got to memorialize the significance of it somehow. God was here. God spoke to me here. God blessed me here. God dealt with me here. God pulled me out of being stuck. Between a rock and a hard the, the rock, oh, the rock, the rocks. He picks up the rock and he turns it into a pillar. <laughs> His pillow became a pillar of his faith experience with God. And then he takes oil out. And he pours it on the rock to stain it and make it distinct from the others. So that every time I walk by this place, I'll remember that what changed my life happened in this spot. When I put my head on the rock over there, I don't know how we missed it all these years. I don't know how we watch the rock in the first few verses and then the rock in the middle and then the rock at the end where he picks it up and he pours oil all over it and is, and is going crazy over the rock because it's not about the blessing. It's not about the open heavens. It's not about the voice of God. It's not about the angels. It's not about the ladder. It's not about all of the benefits. It's about the beauty of what happens. When a broken man or a broken woman gets their head on Jesus Christ, the solid rock. And the experience shook him so much. The presence of God manifested in such a visceral way that he walked away from the place believing this right here is where God lives. This right here 
is the gate of heaven. In fact, I'm going to rename the whole city. This place is no longer Luz Stony Ground. I'm going to call this place Bethel, which means inaccurately, by the way, this is the house of God. What, what freaked him out to that point? What freaked him out is he had such an encounter at such a critical moment. He thought, surely God lives in hard places. Now, he's not, he's not expecting anything yet. He don't have a dime to his name. In fact, he can't even tithe. He looks at God and he says, I promise you, if you'll bless me of everything you give me, I'll give you, I'll give you 10%. But right now I ain't got 10% of nothing is nothing. He doesn't realize that God is going to make him one of the richest men in the Old Testament. He doesn't realize that God is going to multiply him into essentially what was essentially the king of a nation. He doesn't realize that God is going to change his entire life. He, he thinks God lives in hard places. Letting us know that when you're in a hard place, God can come and meet you in such a significant way that you're sure this is all there is. And so he gets up from there and he has to pay God something. He can't go through that kind of experience and not offer something, but he don't have nothing to offer. So he offers a vow. I ain't got nothing to give you, but I promise you, I vow to you. First little thing you give me for the rest of my life. You give me something, I'll give the tenth. I'll give the tenth. I'll give the tithe. I'll give 10% of it back to you. I'll send that thing up the ladder every time you send something down. I'll send you up a seed every time a blessing comes down. I'll send, I'll send something. Up. And, he, and he goes on. And his life, he just, he just falls rear end backwards into favor. The rest of his life, you know, if he falls in Calmoner, he comes up smelling like roses. I mean, his story is just, it's just amazing, the favor of God. But, but it all came from the rock. The rock he met when he was stuck in a. I ain't been able to track this down. I spent a little bit of time in study, you know, and um, I ain't been able to track this down. I, I invested in a um, pretty expensive commentary series. You wouldn't think commentaries would cost thousands of dollars, but there's some to do. And I uh, had to wait a while to get it. And I uh, finally got it. And I was sure the answer would be in the, it's not. It's one of the only reasons I bought it. I've been trying to track this down. I can't track it down. I've been looking for this. I can't find it. The, the thing I've been looking for is, you know, and I'm done preaching. This is just extra. The thing I've been looking for is, uh, I've been looking for names. Names are important. And, uh, <laughs> I fasted for three days before I named both of my sons. We're losing that in our society, but names are God help you if you had stupid parents that gave you a stupid name. I won't give examples. I want to keep the members to come to the church.
But names are important. And they were important to God. Important to God. So important. When God was walking with a man named Abram, the more that God walked with him, and the more that God pulled him away from his past and some of the flaws of his character, the more that God pulled him closer to himself, God said, uh, you, you can't keep that name. That's not you. That's not who you really are. You shall no longer be called Abram. I got a new name for you. Your name is Abraham. And, and then God started introducing himself. Jehovah started introducing himself. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God. Hi, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Abraham. And then Abraham had a righteous and holy son, Isaac. A son so righteous and so committed to the heart of God and the will of his father that he was willing to sacrifice his own life when Abraham said, God told me to offer you up as a burnt offering. Isaac was willing. He was 40 years old at the time. Abraham was elderly and Isaac could have resisted. But Isaac willingly laid down on the altar and prepared to die. Isaac was a good son. God said, I am the God of Abraham. And I am the God of Isaac. Jehovah attaches his name. I am the God. I don't know. I am the God. Yahweh. I am the God of Abraham. I see that. I am the God of Isaac. Then he starts walking with Jacob. And, and, and slowly but surely he starts to pull Jacob out of his mess. And slowly but surely he starts to pull Jacob out of his conning ways and out of his deceit and, and out of his stealing and robbing and out of his inconsistency. And, and one night he comes down himself and God wrestles with him because sometimes when you won't listen to teaching, God has to come down and break something in you to heal something in you. And he, he comes down and he breaks Jacob's hip and, and Jacob gets up weeping and, and crying and stumbling and God said now 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 you're where you need to be now I am changing your name you shall no longer be called Jacob which in their language it doesn't mean it today here but in their language it meant supplanter and trickster and thief and robber greasy slimy he said he said you're no longer that anymore your name is Israel, which means a prince with God. I'm going to do for you what I did for your grandpa. I'm going to change your name. But what bothers me is after God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, God still walked around introducing himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't do that with Abraham. He never said, I am the God of Abram. He used the name that, that he had changed. You know, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I can't find the reason. I can't find the answer. Maybe it's that he wanted those of us whose character is less than stellar. Maybe he wanted those of us that have had issues a long time that have still not changed. Maybe he wanted those of us that have been stuck in a hard place so long we started to act like things that aren't even in our character. Maybe he wanted broken people. And people who go back and forth and people who are good one day and bad the other and people that are inconsistent and, and, and people that are that are that are holy one day. And human the next. Maybe, maybe he wanted them to know I'm your God too.
I'm the God of Abraham, the one that's been walking with me for decades. I'm the God of Isaac, the child that did everything right. But I'm also the God of the one that walked away from the faith, backslid, ran the other direction, did everything they could to resist it, and has just come back now brand new. And, and lest anybody look down their nose at you and think less of you, I'm going to introduce myself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so you'll know that Jacob has a place to Maybe, or maybe the answer's more simple and more direct than that. Yeah, maybe the answer was in the text we read. Maybe God kept calling him Jacob because it wasn't Israel that put his head on the rock. Because the well need no physician. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't Israel that put his head on the rock. It, it was back when he was Jacob. It, it's not the good people that need the work of Jesus. It's not the clean people that need the washing and cleansing of the blood. It, it, it's, it's not the wise people that need the immutable counsel of wisdom. It, it's... It's Jacob. So, wherever you are in this church today, God dropped a ladder down and sent me down it with a word. Today, I have been your messenger. What they called in the New Testament the angels of the church didn't mean they were supernatural. He said to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, to the angel of the church at Sardis, to the angel at the church of, of Thessalonica. It, it was just saying the messenger. And for those of you stuck between a rock and a hard place, God sent me and Bishop in here today to talk to you about Jacob. And what it means and what can change and what can happen if you get your head on Jesus Christ. Rock. Stand to your feet. Now, preach way longer than I wanted to. I'm going to let you go. But, but. If you'll indulge me for just a second. If you will bow your head. And close your eyes. There are people in this room. That are not. In the right position. You don't have your head placed right. You don't have your life in proper relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There are things you're running from. There are things you're trying to run to. And God's been letting you go. And this season of darkness and lack of direction has come so you'll stop. And God has sent a word down and, and offered you a rock to rest your weary head. A rock of salvation, a rock of inner healing, a rock of recovery. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me in public before people, I will be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Paul wrote in Romans 10, that the mechanics of salvation work this way. You must first hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe it in your heart. And then you must confess it publicly with an open mouth that Jesus Christ, that you believe he lived, he died, he rose again on the third day. And Paul said, with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Today I want to offer you an opportunity to get positioned on the rock. If you're in this place 
and you want to get saved today whether it's for the first time or whether you've backslidden and you want to come back home if you're in this place and you need to get your head in the right spot raise up your hand right now raise up your hand right now raise up your hand right now thank you brother raise up your hand thank you brother raise up your hand raise up your hand raise up your hand thank you sister raise up your hand thank you brother I see you thank you in the balcony I see you God bless you God bless you if you put your hand up I want you to pray this prayer of faith and confession with me Lord Jesus I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord I believe you lived I believe you died and I believe on the third day you rose again today I fix my mind I set my head I set my thoughts on you Jesus I ask you to forgive me of my sins I ask you to lead me and guide me I give you permission to take me in any direction that you want me to go I repent of my sins I don't want to be that way anymore I'm sick and tired of my own self I ask you to purge me I give you license to wrestle with me I give you license to change my character and change my name and change who I am and today I leave here with my head on the rock in Jesus name give the Lord a great praise all over the house oh yes Oh, yes. There's a ladder here. If you want to send something up, you, you can get an envelope in your hand. You can get a seed in your hand. If you didn't get your tithe in earlier, maybe you came in late, you can get your tithe in your hand. Remember, every time you give to God, you're, you're sending something back up the ladder in response, in response to his goodness towards you. Now, I pray, may the Lord God bless you. May the Lord God keep you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. I pray that as God drops that ladder, you'll have the confidence and faith to climb up. I pray you'll have the confidence and the faith to raise your perspective and elevate your thoughts and, and look for another route because you're seeing higher than you were before. I pray that the depression and the anxiety that's been caused by being stuck between a rock and a hard place would melt away from you as you put your trust wholly in Jesus Christ alone. I pray the Lord blesses you in your health. I pray the Lord blesses you in your family. I pray the Lord blesses you in your finances. I pray the Lord blesses you with your marriage and with your children. I pray the Lord opens up doors for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a great praise. I love you, Christian world. If you want to give something, you can bring it to the altar or you can text it or you can give online. We'll see you Wednesday night. Have a great week.